Hey, you're listening to the Wise Words Book Club, where we don't just read, we remember. And in this case, we take the best ideas from some of the best non-fiction books and teach you how to apply them to the real world. So, without further ado, let's listen to some wise words. So, The Molecule of More. Um, what's this book about then, Tristan? Well, I mean, it's a pretty broad question. <laughs> what isn't it about, really? Like, it kind of tackles every single area of behavior. I think something to get, um, something to be made clear is it is a simplified version. As in, sure. it's very general in terms of, like, uh, it can be applied to every behavior. But that doesn't mean that it causes every behavior. Um, you know, it can it can initiate a certain element or like um, a certain aspect of it, but it's not like the be all and end all. Uh, you'll understand when we like go into depth about certain areas that it impacts, that dopamine yeah. impacts, but I think it's just like a good sort of clarification to say that first. Yeah. So the, so the molecule of more is all about dopamine um, and it's the role it plays in human behavior. Um, I'd say human motivation as well. Yeah. And various areas of our life from uh, competition with others from cr- to cravings, um, yeah. even even love. Yeah, so many, so sure. many aspects because, well, OK, so I think the, uh, a good analogy that he um, describes dopamine as at the very beginning of the book. Um, is this uh is this like up and down yeah. sort of motion? So I'm looking at some of my notes, mate, and I think what you're t- touching on is he like, talks about the difference between extra personal your hands and peri personal. Like that doesn't require it. So as, as peri personal is anything within your local vicinity or like, something you can touch right here and now. You don't really need to require a decision. Like, like I don't need to think but about picking anything up this coffee that's cup. further than okay. That and then he talks about the extra personal, which is characteristics and things that are outside of yourself. Effort, time, and planning, and potentially to to get or to hold. So, for example, enjoy the most. And dopamine would help you fuel uh, your, um, your day in terms of if you're planning what you were going to do, you would have to think in, in advance of like, oh, what's going to take effort? What do I want to do today? Yeah. Whereas the peripersonal, the here and now type uh, neurotransmitters are more, so there's, there's less choices involved. So you can, you just, yeah, it's it's more uh, instinctual kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think a good point that he touches on is, I think if you don't know about, um dopamine which realistically not many people do it's not really something that comes up a lot of the time but it's it's got but people know but people know the name though that's kind of what i find people interesting know the name yes and it's like they've heard it but like you know it depends what context they've heard it in but i think a lot of people associate it as this like pleasure molecule but it's not, it's not about pleasure it's about anticipating pleasure um it is what drives you it's the motivation to get you somewhere um and I think when when you have this idea of like a future, a future choice, a future decision, something like that, it becomes fantasy. Reality is in the moment, whereas fantasy is in the future. And dopamine mm-hmm. basically controls your fantasy. Controls Dope- dopamine is essentially the bridge between reality and fantasy. It's yeah. it's it's the molecule that creates the desire to go after the fantasy. Um, I mean, it's the molecule of more. Hey. That's, I mean, that's the book title. It's got a very specific job, so it looks to um, maximize our resources in the future. So basically, the pursuit of better things, mm. um, and and basically, this, this is what I find quite interesting is the pursuit of better things. So what is a better thing? And in my head, we are biologically wired for some things which are seen to be better. For example, maybe that is uh, more friends, more more social status, more more money. Um, these are biological wirings that dopamine helps us to try and get to or these places that or achievements that dopamine tries to fuel yeah i think if you break those down the like money wealth things like that <clears throat> it comes down to like our survival impulses you know mm-hmm. like our brain doesn't care if it has too much of so- what well, dopamine doesn't care if you have too much of something you know it's like as long as i'm surviving that's the main thing so it, it, the problem is is that that can there's a spectrum to that and it can be too much and we want more, more, more. And so therefore we're never happy with the things we have. Um, mm-hmm. But I think, yes, it goes after the things that we want, which is, you know, sex, reproduction, uh, like you said, money, wealth, power, 
social status, all those kinds of things, because it doesn't has have like a limit. It doesn't like yeah. dopamine doesn't say, oh, that's enough right now. What yeah. we desire. Well, the way I kind of think of dopamine, right, is like if you didn't have the if dopamine wasn't wasn't in your brain in terms of creating these desires and places to go and goals to achieve, if you were just happy with everything you had right now, uh, we wouldn't do anything. Yeah. If you think about it, yeah. if we didn't have this motivation to change and to chase these fantasies that we have, whether it be the new girlfriend or the nice car, I mean, these are all like tangible like outcomes that a dopamine is sort of created in our head. But if we didn't have these desires, we would then, as a race, probably go extinct because we'd all just be sat on the couch m- munching on popcorn, yeah. um, watching movies because there's nothing else to do because we're content. Um, so this level of like never ever being content is actually very valuable in terms of human progress like without it we wouldn't we wouldn't achieve anything yeah well like think about it if you were to go back to foragers times for example survival yeah. had a very different meaning than today okay yeah. most people um have you know shelter and food and water and things like that so you kind of have like this sort of sloping up graph where it's like you know, you start to gain a lot if, you know, back in foragers times, like if, if you have food and you have shelter and everything like that. But now it's like, well, do I have the right type of roof or do I have the best kind of food? And it's very more, it becomes more specific rather than general. You know what I mean? I, also, I think it's very interesting when you talk about like, oh, um, oh, I want this type of roof. That's, that's always for me, it's been like a moving target. Um, it kind of changes based on what other people desire as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, like the, yeah, your goals are influenced heavily by um, p- the, what other people see as achievable goals. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to have a look. Should we talk about the here and now neurotransmitters as well, just yeah. to sort of talk about the difference? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's a good aspect to touch on. Um, so I think he uses this sort of contrast in the book so he yes the dopamine is the um the anticipation molecule whereas he describes oxytocin serotonin like other little neurotransmitters endorphins endorphins as well um as the here and now molecule okay so dopamine is the future and um and and like oxytocin anticipation of the future yeah they're they are they are the present um and the, he talks about the brain, it's constructed in a way where there's, it ha, it's like two, two systems, but they have to be balanced, okay? So it's like, it's like a spectrum. You go one way and it's too much, or you go another way and it's too much of the other. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's constantly working in accordance with each other. So very easy to like, you know, it topple one way or topple the other. It's, it's hard to find the right sort of balance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was going to think of a really sort of visual analogy of a seesaw, and if you've got a really obese woman on one side, I don't know why I said woman, uh, but and like a little child on the other side, you would, it, yeah, that's the way I see it. So if you topple it one way or the other, you end up either being too sort of in the here and now, or you end up being too in the future. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think the main difference that I got from this was the so the dopamine tends to be the molecule of obsessive yearning or like anticipating and obviously as we said before the future so it's more of a you look to the future you desire something and then you chase after it whereas the here and now molecules are all about um obviously being present in the here and now but they're the most associated with sort of long-term relationships mm. um whereas dopamine is associated with as you will the chase yeah. or, or getting into a new relationship um i don't know if you want to elaborate on that well uh, yes i think um like if if you if you describe it as like a step process, so for instance, you know, you go out and you're at a club and or wherever, and you know you're you're programmed to reproduce to have sex, so like your DNA can pass be passed down. So naturally, dopamine is like, okay, I want to find someone, you know, I'm and dopamine releases testosterone. Okay, so testosterone makes you more horny, and therefore you want to go and find some like someone to mate with. If we're putting it that way. <laughs> um, and so basically that that drives you to the to the point at which you're almost about to have sex and then as you're experiencing it your body needs to save it your body needs to save the experience so it's like i enjoyed this experience so i'll tr- try and do it again okay because it's important to your like your well like you know your genetic code sort of thing so um 
So basically what happens is dopamine drops and the here and now molecules, they shoot up because they're, they're, um, they're related to experiencing the here and now, so the, the present moment. So what happens is you end up experiencing it while testosterone is high. So testosterone stays high. And so that's kind of like the mixture in which to, you know, it first happens. The problem is, is that when, well, not problem, but when you go into relationships, for instance, the dopamine molecule loves novel information. Okay. So it loves the new stuff. It like shoots its, its, its like energy up a bit. So it loves the, it loves the novel information. But the problem is if you're in a relationship, those novels, um, those novel experiences happen again and so they become familiar the novel becomes familiar and when that happens dopamine is still trying to look to the future to look for the new novel information hence why you get a lot of people that like cheat or you know are looking for something other um and so you need to try and make this transition between a dopamine fueled relationship to an h and n relationship it's interesting as well i was just thinking about this this um so oxy oxytocin is actually called like the i want to say the cuddle molecule and i mean you could argue here this is often a tangent but the more a couple cuddles the more likely they are to have a long-term relationship because that's um that's a here and now experience molecule um but if your relationship's more around just basically uh less intimate almost as you say maybe animalistic type sort of mm. sex and just desire you are less likely to be in a long-term relationship I, I don't know if there's a correlation there in my head it would make sense i guess the here and now molecule is also about disclosing information like feeling um feeling in the moment of uh feeling empathy in the moment for example mm. so the more empathetic you are with your partner and the less it's about physical sex then the more likely you are going to have a long-term relationship i think yeah that's kind of the, the point i'm trying to make well yes yeah. Like you can't empathize with something in the future, whereas you can empathize with something in the here and now. And the oxytocin and serotonin are especially like um, important in terms of empathy. You know, empathy mm. is very high when you're in the current moment, when you're talking with someone else, and you're and you're trying to see it from their point of view, right? Exactly. I, I would even go further than that. I'd say if you if you are fueled by dopamine, your empathy levels are practically zero. Um, yeah. because you are chasing a future and you don't care about how you kind of get there really yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's not really it, empathy isn't a function of dopamine as dopamine is the molecule of more dopamine is maximizing resources and it doesn't really care how it gets there I don't know if you want to start moving on to sort of the the role of dopamine in terms of like cravings and addiction uh, did you make did you pick up anything in that sort of area yes um, yeah I think uh, I think a, a... A big aspect that he talked about was this um, was this element of how quickly you can uh, you can get stimulated by something. So it's like we want uh, we want food and we want sex and things like that, but we have this sort of check in period afterwards, okay, where we go, or oh, actually, I'm full, or you know, I've just had sex, I don't need it again right now. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, but the thing is, is that drugs doesn't have that, okay? And drugs also have this a higher spike, and it's much quicker. You know, the first time I take a bite of um, of something, like you know, it, it, I might get some pleasure from it, but it won't be anywhere near as much as the first instance the like drug hits in. You know, sure. um, so with those two combined, it means drugs are like very, very powerful, and they kind of take priority over anything else. The only time that the, oh, it's to do with the ease isn't it in it, terms yes, of exactly yeah. the ease of which like it can um it can affect you and i think when um when uh the only time it changes is when you know your your survival is being challenged okay where you really need food or you know um or water or something like that that's when drugs do go down the order but realistically most of the time that doesn't occur and so drugs will are really hard to you know destabilize from the hierarchy and make them push down further yeah 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 i've got um i've got quite i've got quite a few notes here on um sort of dopamine and competition so so i've got here yes yeah, so i've got yeah winning competitions along with eating and having sex is essential for evolutionary success um it's obviously uh winning competitions or uh, potential status battles that gives us access to food and reproductive partners so as a result it's not surprising that winning 
obviously is a desirable state for us to re uh to get to therefore it's dopamine uh dopaminergetic um mm. what, what i thought was interesting is the distinction between oh, i know we talk, talked about it before but the surge of dopamine feels good but it's a different feeling from a surge of h and n yeah um which is a surge of sort of satisfaction so the problem with um dopamine is it's not a pleasurable feeling of satisfaction and if you have a pleasurable feeling of satisfaction then you don't want more the problem with dopamine is the feeling the feeling leaves you wanting more mm. um and that was the one thing I, I took away from this specifically for competition because basically the argument was winning like drugs can be addictive because if it's all about the pursuit and achieving more you can never really have enough of competition because it's yeah. always going to be somebody trying to compete or take you from your your spot yeah and i almost feel like um it can explain a lot of uh, celebrities and maybe even ex-sportsmen's drug addictions in the later stage of their lives, or maybe even rock stars as well. It's like you have this high of like where you've got to in the past, but because you can never, like, as as you age and stuff, you can't keep up where you used to be, or maybe the truth comes out about you. Your 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 winning or like the amount you win goes down, Speci specifically in sport, right? Because you can't keep up because you're old age. Yeah. And therefore, you need to fill that void of the more the winning feeling. And how do you do that? You turn to drugs. Um, yeah. And it, and then he makes an interesting point as well. Like no one likes to lose, right? But it's ten times as worse after you win. Yeah. So th there was an anecdote in the book. So so somebody was nominated for the best doctor. I don't know where this happens, but then that will lead to the anxiety. The next year is will I be nominated again? So it's almost better to never be nominated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. you can't get it, because you have this sort of identity to live up to and i think he talks about that a lot in terms of loss aversion as is as it is more painful to like you know lose 10 pounds than to than the feeling of gaining 10 pounds you know yeah. uh, the feeling of loss is much worse than and hence why it goes with like a lot of things with dopamine is that you know you constantly want to be looking to the future then because you don't want to feel what it feels like to you know stay in that sort of loss period you know mm -hmm. I think I think an interesting point about the dopamine in general as well is you, the anticipation is actually the pleasure in itself. Mm. So like you don't even need to uh, actually obtain what you're going after if you can really anticipate it and visualize it properly to a degree. Um, so that's kind of why I think there was like this argument for like fantasy worlds. People get lost in fantasy because it's actually ultimately more pleasurable than being stuck in the present. Yeah. Um, which is kind of that idea of like I said before, it's when you're in a fancy land, you're getting a relief from the low of reality and you're having the high, like the high is essentially just relief. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you uh, take away from the fact that desire, um, dopamine is split into two sort of systems? So you've got okay. dopamine desire yeah. and dopamine control. Yeah, so he, the way he explains it, I, and once again, I think we need to make sure we reiterate it. This is not the actual biological reality. I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than this, but the author explained it in terms of there are two circuits of um, dopamine. So there's the source of desire, which is the, 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 the desire circuit, sorry, and tenacity. So that's the control circuit. Um, and his anecdote was, or the, his his phrase was, this dopamine is the passion that points the way and the willpower that gets us there. So the control circuit can be sort of seen as your willpower and then the desire circuit can be seen as your passion towards or your um, desire for an objective. Yeah. Um, what I thought was really quite interesting is back to what you talked about with the balance. So with this, you can have a balance between desire and control. So my understanding was that your control circuit comes into full fledged, which is in your prefrontal cortex when you're around about 20 to 22 um, which basically means your control circuit isn't fully developed until you're 20 to 22, which means um, as a teenager, you're actually more likely to be searching pleasure than you are to be able to control that source of pleasure, yeah, yeah. which would explain a lot of our teenage sort of behavior. But also what's interesting to say is the control circuit is sort of more cold and calculated. It's it's the psychopath, as you will, of, of the desire circuit, whereas the desire part is more the lover or the um, hopeless romantic. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I see it. Um, and they, they've got to keep each other in check, right? But the problem is when you go too far one way, you end up with an actual psychopath. And if you end up too far the other way, you end up somebody who's so addicted to sex or, or to the idea of love or some sort of fancy he has in his head that you can't see uh, reality. Yeah. Well, I think uh, he uses a great, um, a great analogy in terms of a train track. And mm -hmm. so a train is heading towards five people 
or you could push someone in front of the train and stop uh, stop it from killing the five people by killing one. Now, he talks about distance and how distance has a, it plays a massive effect with H and N and dopamine because most people would never push someone in front of a train. You know, it's such a moral dilemma. It's it's a, the amount of empathy that you have when you touch someone is much higher than if you're further away. And then he says, okay, so then you take a couple of steps back and then it turns out that you can flick a switch and that makes it... Rather, well, rather than push them, yeah? So it's, yeah. you either flick a switch to kill somebody or you push them. Yeah, and then he, and yeah. he does it even more. Like, you know, then you could go to like a, a train um, director somewhere else who like has to pick up the phone and then flick the switch or you could go to the engineer at the very beginning who has the like choice to either like, you know, kill like create a switch that kills one person or five people. And it's much yeah. easier to do it then the further away you get uh, you the further you get away the, the further you get away from the result of your action right it's the further away you are from um feeling like some sort of agency within that problem mm. like the, the further you are away so for example if i press the button now to this is i think this is really interesting dilemma so i heard a different version it was kind of like so like for the president of the united states right trump or not trump um uh the dilemma is uh or the 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 situation was if he presses a button to kill a million people with a nuke like it's just a button press right and he kill a million people he doesn't feel the the empathy of killing all these people but the way they twisted it was like okay right so he shouldn't be allowed to press that button unless he gets the key and the key is in the heart of somebody who stood next to him yeah so the whole point is he would have to kill that person take out the heart and take the key to then um sort of feel the actual reality of actually killing somebody let alone 10 million people or whatever um, which I thought was quite an interesting sort of idea, like bringing it to the forefront of your mind. Because, I mean, we all press buttons all the time on our keyboards. I mean, if that killed somebody, you wouldn't, I mean, I'm not saying you wouldn't have second thoughts, no. but you, you can't really feel it. Well, they do this with with so many things. Like you think about all these, um, you know, famine adverts um, of like mm -hmm. African children. And realistically, you're far away and it doesn't affect you as much. If you were there in person, you were actually witnessing this your mm -hmm. amount of empathy levels is like shooting through the roof. Um, and it's strange that like, you know, if you construct a world in which you can be further away or closer to someone, it changes your whole like um, choice altogether. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I guess with the, with the dopamine system, because you're always in the future, you're not in, actually in reality. You're not, you're, you're not empathetic at all. You can actually be more calculated and ruthless mm. to a degree. I think that one of my main points from this this whole book was the idea that dopamine always pursues more. It's not it's not moral. It's not it's not moral. There's no morality within it. It's just a force to get what what you want. It for, for example here I've I've got a highlight saying dopamine pursues more, not morality. To dopamine, force and fraud are nothing more than tools, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and back to what we were saying earlier. So I was, here it says like so someone with a highly active control circuit might be cold and calculating. Um, and devoid of emotion because the, the way i saw it as well was, was emotion was the sort of um the uh the other end of the spectrum from the sort of dopamine in terms of uh, emotion can overwhelm or control dopamine's um caution and calculation mm. so emotion itself actually prevents you from being cold and calculated i think that's why one of the one of the main things they say not only about serial killers having like obviously a high control uh, sorry not serial killers psychopaths having a high um control circuit but they also lack empathy in any sense yeah um well it's it's uh like he, he has a bunch of quotes from like you know very famous people throughout time where if because they're mostly like geniuses or you know people that are like artists or anything like that which means they're quite high on the spectrum of um of dopamine they're very mm -hmm. forward like looking they're very like they want to hone their sort of craft those kinds of things um and people like that because they're further up that uh, up that level it means that they're not as empathetic and which means that like all these all these quotes that he had of you know i love humanity but i hate people yeah it seems to be a rule for all these geniuses yeah. because they spend so much time in their thoughts and they're future. looking for improvements and they want yeah. to progress like you know the human civilization but when it comes to actually experiencing it they they like would help like there's um einstein was very famous for that he was like you know because his life was 
obviously he's a genius, but you know his marriages and everything like that went um, down the down the drain. Um, and he was like, he I can't remember the quote off my heart, but it was it was similar along those lines. That yeah. like yeah no, I want to improve humanity, but being yeah, but I don't like people or that type of thing. Yeah, a lot of them say the same thing, and I can kind of I think I from what I can see from Elon Musk, he's quite similar as well. So when you're so future orientated, mission driven, you forget that there are real lives and people and like, I guess, yeah, the argument is if you reduce the empathy, you can then pursue the future more actively and you won't care really how you get there. And that's kind of where I feel all these geniuses were at. Um, They, they were relentlessly pursuing a vision that they have. Hence, all visionaries do that, which is highly dopaminogenic. Um, but you do, it does come at a cost, right? It comes at the cost of empathy and, uh, I guess, uh, enjoying the here and now almost. I feel like these people are compulsive future sort of finders or people who are always orientated within the future rather than in the present. Yeah. And, and that's, why they're, that's why they're so impatient. I think that's, I think that w- I would say an impatient would be a good an obvious trait for somebody who's very future orientated yeah or or craving some sort of hit um of, of progress or whatever it is um what about i guess we kind of already just touched on this with dopamine and goals so um the way the way he explained to me this is how i conceptualize goals now so controlled dopamine takes the excitement and motivation from desire so all that feeling of like oh passion i really need to get there um, and evaluates the options to get there, selects the tools and plots the strategy to get what it wants. So mm-hmm. that's why people who, as we said before, who have really high control dopamine are sort of calculated because they literally have the ability to evaluate the steps to get there. Yeah. And they, and, and they, they act on them essentially. Um, yeah. Uh, once again, dopamine doesn't care how something's obtained. It just, it just gets, wants to get what it wants and it wants to get um, more and it doesn't care how it gets it. Well, I, th- I think that's a perfect example when like, when you apply them to sort of relationships, Mm -hmm. so um, he talks about uh, having two types of relationships or yeah, Um, one of them being agentic and one of them being affiliate. Now he talked about agentic in terms of you have a relationship, but for a means as Mm -hmm. in like, you know, I'm friends with you, but to get this, or I'm doing this to get that, you know, and um People, there's a goal behind it almost right yeah exactly and people high with like uh, high in dopamine normally have these kind of agentic type relationships whereas on the other end of the spectrum with um people who are higher in like h and n they have affiliate um relationships so those are more like those are seen as you know more empathetic like more caring more genuine um more mutually beneficial i'd say whereas yeah. the agentic relationships tend to be more like a take give and take relationship um uh, affiliates are more like give give um for the benefit of both parties sort of thing um yeah yeah no that was that is an interesting take but once again i think it's it's is wise if for those who are listening not to take it as like a binary rule it's not like you're either agentic or you're affiliate yeah. um it's the same way if you're not you're not either a desire person or a control person it's not it's not like that it's a spectrum yeah, it's, so you, exactly. you can have tendencies towards one side, but I think one of the main points in this book is the the more you go to one side, the more it flips the seesaw. Yeah. So it's like it's like that obese woman eating more and more crisps. She's slowly that seesaw is that that girl is flying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the way I sort of see it. So, and obviously, once again, you can then arguably go back the other way as well. Um, yeah. So if you're really hyper control orientated. Um, like there is a possibility in every way, but I assume I assume as well that this is highly genetic as well, as well as obviously socially um, brought about. Um, he does talk about a lot, um, a lot about genetics and how it mm. plays quite a big role, which I'm a bit skeptical of. I I believe that you know uh, that you can be slightly more okay. dopamine, uh, dopamine, yeah, dopamine, uh, dopaminogenic. Oh, God, I can't even say it right now. Um, it's made as a mouthful trust yeah. um, <laughs> are higher in dopamine than others yeah uh, but I think it's also like I don't know so he talks about you, um, how like yeah. certain alleles have higher um, rates of like dopamine and sure. so people who have like a certain one he's, he calls it 7R or know, 4DRA or something like that um but that these people are more likely to pass it down and 
he talks about them in terms of like different types of people like immigrants because they would be more likely to up and leave their their home they're more sure. adventurous and more adventurous means looking to the future and therefore like so uh, he talks in terms of america because of you know, so many uh, okay you're arguing for the societal pressures as well mm. yeah yeah like, yeah i think i think you're right so i've literally just pulled up the selfish gene here because there was a quote that i quite liked so he his argument is it's not about genet- ge- ge- genetic determinism so it's not about like does one gene really actually yeah like, matter he said it's it's perfectly possible to hold genes that exert a statistical influence so not like it's not like oh you're gonna be like this it's like you have a higher chance of being like that yeah exactly because the foundations are set but then he said this influence can be modified overridden or reversed yeah um what? which is kind of the, the argument you're making right it's like you you might have a real, like a uh, a basis where you will have more dopamine or yeah uh, or some, something like that but you, your social uh, environment actually shapes it just as much exactly exactly and it's like you know if everything happens to go to plan yeah and you know, oh, look I mean, yeah who's got um I, I think the interesting example would be like somebody who doesn't who lives in an environment where he doesn't take any drugs. He's somebody who t- everybody takes drugs. Like you're obviously going to be high, more highly. Uh, the, the chance of you taking drugs and being addicted is much higher. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Like that's that's almost like a no-brainer. Common sense sort of tells you that, right? It's um, and that's not. I don't even would, wouldn't even say that's genetic. That is literal social environment. Yeah. Can you get away from it? Well, th- um, then it comes down to like the whole nature nurture like argument. You know, it's like how much really like plays in your favor of nature and nurture but um yeah i think you know obviously everyone can everyone has like you know a a complete different makeup you know a completely different like accumulation of allele so everyone Mm -hmm. can be slightly better in some areas than others um but yeah it's it's not like right to you know label someone as oh okay well he's got this allele so he's more likely to be a drug addict because I think I think I think the point you're trying to step on is the fact that you can then start discriminating from birth, <laughs> almost like if you knew what their like their traits were going to be like before yeah. they were even born. It's kind of like well, then you can yeah, you can discriminate from from essentially the beginning. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean let's 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 move away from that because I feel like that's probably a topic for another time. Going into like actual uh, maybe well, maybe if you review the selfish gene. Um, in terms of like my last, I'm looking at all my notes here, and like we kind of covered most of it. We talked about emotion, we talked about dopamine, we talked about goals, we talked about um, competition. I quite like the idea of just roughly touching on on um, salience and schizophrenia. Mm. So the way I took this is our brain consistently, as we go through life, separates um, essential from non-essential things in your environment. Yeah. Um, so when you first move to a new country you you are your brain is highly active because it's trying to work out where everything is where the nearest i don't know um supermarket is so you can buy food etc so you become highly aware of everything around you then over time once you become used to things which is like the classic idea of like we are creatures of habit your brain doesn't have to think about these things anymore because it knows it exists or knows where it is or it knows what's important for example um but the what my point is here is dopamine is actually the reason why we pay attention to things that are new. So what dopamine scans your environment for is things that have the potential to affect your future. So um, basically what happens is if something happens, like let's say you're walking outside in, in, in a forest and you hear some uh, a hedge rustling. I mean, obviously we probably know it's going to be a dog, but your dopamine um, sensor will basically go up saying, wake up, pay attention. This is important because this is not something that you've probably seen too many times before. Yeah. Um, so I think it was really interesting to to think about the role of, of, of dopamine as um, almost your attention mechanism. Yeah. It, it helps you choose what to pay attention to. For example, let's say your goal, your future goal is I want to make lots of money. Your dopamine system almost then controls your attention. So the fact that when you're skimming through the news, you're looking for the latest stock tips. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, exactly. Um, and it's always scanning for things that could potentially affect your future, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah. I think, yeah, the the when you talk about the schizophrenia, it's like all these things are on a spectrum, you know? Um, and so when things are malfunctioning in terms of like your salience, it means that things that should be familiar, things that your brain has already categorized and doesn't need to apply energy to can suddenly almost seem like they're novel again. And so people with schizophrenia or who are really high on the um, dopamine uh, spectrum are like very like sort of, like they they suddenly snap into it and they look at things that shouldn't be very important to them 
And because yeah. they, they can't separate the essential from the non-essential, essentially. Yeah. And because yeah. they're, they're seeing it as novel again, they think that it has uh, correspondence to the thing that should be important to them. So, for instance, mm-hmm. um, a lot of schizophrenia people when they're when they're watching TV. And they suddenly think that the people speaking in TV are speaking directly to them Um, because it shouldn't like, it should be familiar that, you know, when you're watching TV, it's like, obviously they're not speaking directly to you, but a schizophrenic person, a schizophrenic person. Yeah. Yeah. They can't tell what, yeah, they can't tell what's essential from non-essential. I really like this idea. So, um, so obviously our brain over time, like I said before, it separates what's essential in an environment to what's non-essential, et cetera. So you know really what, what you should pay attention to, what you shouldn't. I mean, if I'm sure if you look around wherever you're listening to this or, or if it's like a bedroom, you'd know exactly where the things that you use the most often belong and then other things would completely disappeared in your mind. That's like an example of it. But the way I like how he conceptualized what schizo- schizophrenia feels like is what if a familiar place feels like an alien environment to you? And I quite like that. So like, imagine like looking at your waking up in the morning and not knowing where you are. So I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that before, but, but imagine that every day. And that's kind of what their problem is. And I find that mental, like every social environment, they, they, it's like an alien environment. They can't get comfortable because they can't work out what they should. Like the thing is we, we find comfort from being able to structure and control our environment, right? They can't. Yeah. Because everything to them is just chaos, and they can't integrate it into like a into a model that works for them. Yeah, no, exactly. It um, would be terrifying, I think. Yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah. Um. So that yeah, I, I for me, I, I it's not something I ever thought about before, and I to be honest, I, I, I I'm gonna say I didn't really even know what schizophrenia act, actually was like in terms of the the actual biological reality of like what it would have felt like to be schizophrenic. But for having read this, that is uh, yeah. Um, it makes a lot more sense now, and I can understand how that would come about yeah. as well. Yeah. I can understand now how somebody could be schizophrenic. So if they can't work out um, what's important and what's not in a situation from past experience, then yeah, to me, it's you're just walking around with consistent threats because mm. you don't, you can't make sense of something. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. So yeah, that, I think I think that's pretty much everything from me. I think. Um, uh... Like to touch on like his last point is like his last uh, area of the book is, you know, it's what you want is like harmony. You want a balance between the two. And yeah. he describes it as, you know, your H and N, your like your present moment, you're seeing everything, you're witnessing everything. You're, t- you're applying all your energy in the moment so that you can experience everything in your surroundings. And that's what makes your dopamine such a good predictor. Okay, it's taking in all this information. If you're constantly thinking about the future, then you are missing all the like rich details in the present moment that could be used for the future. You know, so it's like makes so it's like, you know, um, it's refining it constantly. If you're in the moment and then you can think about the future, then you're going to be more accurate. You know, and that's what talks about like the whole prediction error thing. It's like your prediction error is likely to be less because you have all this information to actually like, you know, project into the future and make it most accurate for yourself. Sure. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's kind of the takeaway that I got is that, you know, you want to have this balance between the two because they only work really well when they're working together. Sure. I'm just, I'm just trying to think, cause you, you know, we talked last time about um, after you read a book, how have you, is there anything you've taken from it and applied to your life? I think for me, after having read this book, it's not even about actually, there's not much here that's truly actionable. But I think what what this book is, is quite good to have an awareness of how your brain actually works and realizing that when you desire something, it's your is your brain so in fact sorry this this is a good analogy which i forgot to mention earlier he he um described dopamine as your sort of inner salesman so dopamine essentially sells you this is the desire part of it sells you on what's worth having um so it's it's your body's way of convincing it to take action to try and achieve something that you don't have already um for me it was more about realizing whenever i desire something it's like right so this is dopamine now like and then also trying to realize or trying to become aware of when I'm being calculated or when I'm, or can I be more calculated in a situation where it's more impulsive? Yeah. So for example, uh, I'm trying to think, Oh, do I have a beer at the end of the day? 
my salesman immediately kicks in and goes, yeah, it'd be great. It'd be f-. like, you can even hear it. Your inner voice starts going like, oh yeah, why not? You've had a really hard day. You go for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure we've all experienced that. Like you've, you've worked really hard today, even if you haven't, and your, your brain's telling you all this stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of realizing that this is your desire circuit, what your you sales. Yeah. And, and then what you really need then is the kick in for the control circuit. So somebody like the, the, the voice of reason, as you will, will be like, hang on a second. Aren't you meant to be doing a podcast tomorrow? That type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to stop yourself. Um, and it's it's just for me, it's more understanding like the mechanisms behind it. And also another thing um, I take away from the book is this idea that because um, it's the anticipation molecule, it's, it's actually genuinely more about then your projection of what you think the future is. It's more like your expectation rather than actually what's the reality. So your dopamine system is all about its expectation, not actually the reality. So you can expect something to be really great and you'll sell yourself it. But then if you sell yourself too high, and reality comes in and you, you you're there you're experiencing whatever it was you're chasing you then realize it wasn't quite what you thought it to be yeah yeah if you kind of get me and that is kind of why we're always chasing stuff because we 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 picture in our head like oh my god it'd be so great to be i don't know a bazillionaire and have a bloody yacht um and be yeah do you know what i mean you, you have that yeah. image in your head and you think it's so fucking great and then you get there and then you'd be like oh, okay well what's next <laughs> well great now i've got a load of costs like this 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 yacht's bloody expensive yeah yeah <laughs> um and for me, it's, yeah, it's trying to realize that like our, our projections of what we want aren't actually the reality and nothing is like what we think it will be like. like yeah. The thing is we watch all these films and we think really optimistically of the, of what life could be like. But it's not based um, on reality. But it's not based on reality, no. Yeah. And then when you get there, it's definitely not based on reality because you're fi- you, once again, you'll then hit the low because do- the whole dopamine high is based on, on the future. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, so I think, yeah, another one would be just being trying to appreciate the here and now as cliche and as it sounds really trying to realize that you don't actually need something and that it's just your body's way of trying to get you to take action for your uh genetics needs in terms of reproduction or achieving power of some sort which uh, yeah that's that's kind of what i I don't know about you was it probably something similar yeah no I, i think it is just this awareness that you know makes you um makes you your most creative like we haven't re- we didn't really touch much on creativity but yeah i didn't take too many notes on creativity um, but if you want to touch on it now we can um well just that uh, you know the more like creative is like being able to take the real stuff now and mix it with the sort of fancy you know and okay like yeah. when, you can, when you can make a tangible thing like that like he talks about taking an abstract concept and being able to turn it into a tangible thing so like using your hands or you know using your hand like physical activity with um intelligent stimulation and, sure. but i think i think that all comes down to the idea of using them both well you know yeah making sure that you know yes obviously it's a great thing to be able to think into the future and think of all these possible scenarios that you could you know achieve something but it has to be based in the root of truth and the truth is the reality and that is the h and m so the more you get them to work together the better your um well your creative uh, your creativity and like your future will be yeah no agreed um yeah for, for me that's that's about it i mean i was just the way more i think about creativity you're right it's like taking or yeah being creative is almost taking an idea which kind of doesn't exist and then trying to to merge it together with maybe another idea that doesn't exist yeah. or maybe something that does yeah um i mean what do artists do they look at a scene and they imagine either what's not there or they imagine it in a different light or yeah. they or they or they pay attention to things that other people don't um but yeah for, i think for me that's pretty much pretty much it mate yeah i think so um, and, and that was the molecule of more yeah <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that, guys. If you'd like to check out our book summary, head on over to our website, wisewords.blog. And if you feel like being inspired throughout the week with some little nuggets of wisdom, go and follow us on Instagram at wisewordsummaries. Until next time, guys, have a good one.